Greetings, and welcome to RHDS Music. In my ongoing quest to spread knowledge and musical inspiration, I have compiled different interviews with musical greats, and they share their personal stories of upbringing, practicing, musical challenges, and having a career in the music business. In this interview, we feature legendary musician Greg Bissonette. Greg discusses his techniques, studying at North Texas State, his relationship studying with and doing a clinic with the great Tony Williams, and how he got the gig with Ringo Starr and his all-star band. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the interview. Hi, we're here with Greg Bissonette, the drummer extraordinaire legend, and we're going to talk about uh, lessons with Tony Williams. Hey, Greg. Yeah. Thank you for having me. What an honor that we both got to study with Tony, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, amazing. So uh, maybe you could just start out by um, telling me about how you uh, heard Tony's playing in the, in the beginning. Like, did you, were you in, in um, the straight ahead world or were you in the fusion world or because um, he had, there's all these different eras of Tony and um, you know, what influenced you in the beginning? In the very beginning, um, would have been four and more. Uh, a guy, a great friend of mine named Michael Baker. Michael is a phenomenal drummer. And we went to North Texas together. He's from Min uh, Minneapolis. He was in a band called the M.A. Free Press. And I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And so we met down at North Texas State. And Michael and I had practice rooms near each other. And... Um, this is in 1977. And so I was right out of high school. And I, I knew of Tony Williams, but I haven't, I hadn't really dug super, super, super deep. And so Michael started giving me a few, like the the two hands together, right, 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 and left, left, left together, right and stare, with the hi-hat being on the last, you know, one, or with the toms, and he's going, and we talked about four and more, and I just listened to that album a jillion times and practiced with it. And one of the things that really was fun for me uh, back then was just to see if I could get through both sides of the album. Of course, by then, you know, and, and this isn't nice to say, but it's the truth. And the truth will set you free. Everyone was making cassettes of everyone else's albums. So there was already a cassette, Rob, floating around that you did not have to go over to your record player and turn over. You could just play the whole cassette, you know, and, uh, and how about it for young Tony Williams, you know, the announcer and all that stuff. So anyway, I would play with that cassette all the way through. And then the next, that night play all the way through again. And my big thing was just trying to ding, 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 keep the high hat in two and four and stay knowing where one was because of the way that Tony and Herbie would just get into the, I mean, Ron Carter was the rock, you know, but he would jump on some of those syncopations and things, but just trying to understand where they were taking things with um, kind of metric modulation and rhythms that went over the bar, you know, and Miles would jump in sometimes and so would George, George Coleman, you know, and I talked a lot in the lessons with Tony about those experiences stuff. We can get into that later, but basically that was the first time I went really, really deep. So it would have been the bop side for and more. But then of course that led me immediately. There was no YouTube. There were no Rob Hart podcasts. It was just, Hey man, check out this album and check out this album. Here's a cassette of this and believe it and this and ego and this and that and lifetime. So I got deep, as soon as I got deep into Tony, you know, when he was young, playing the bop stuff, I immediately got deep into the fusion stuff, too. Great. Um, 
So um, did you ever practice uh, the ride symbol? There, there was like a ride symbol rhythm. That it was like kind of fives and threes and all these phrasing and everybody tried to cop that with the finger control. Did you ever try to work on that stuff? Um, it, it's on. No, was that in a book somewhere? No, it was just the quartet, like the quartet stuff. When you do like, um, you know, the the Miles, uh, uh, you know, Ron Carter and 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 uh, Wayne Shorter and Herbie, and um, it was that era, you know, with with Miles Smith. Oh, that. Yeah, I'm re- I'm really familiar with what you're saying. Down to get down, to get down, to get down, to get to get down, 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 down. I played along and tried to copy his ride rhythms all the time, but I didn't know about a specific exercise. And I have to say, I I switched over at that time from traditional grip to match grip. And I know Tony would play traditional and then flip the stick so the butt end would hit the. I remember that stick flip, you know, with his left hand. But I was really I was in the drum line and we we were playing traditional grip and and I started playing in in rock bands and stuff in high school. I started getting a kind of a dime sized blister on the webbing of my left hand where this butt of the stick would hit. And I went, I don't know about traditional grip, you know. And for some reason, I just decided then, I was about 18, I'm just going to switch over to match grip because I was playing a lot of, because you said finger control, I was playing a lot of mallets at the time and four mallet marimba against my will to graduate from North Texas. You had to play four mallet, you know, muscle technique, modified muscle, Lee Howard Stevens, yellow after the rain, these different four mallet marimba things that I've never played since I left uh, and graduated. But to graduate, you had to do that. And I was playing vibes and I was playing, you know, timpani and all these things, even the, even the different tom-tom things and percussion ensemble. They, you, could, you didn't play those traditional grip. And I started getting a bunch of smaller toms, you know, the whole – Hawaii Five O, Neil Peart, Billy Cobb, whatever you want to call it, and bringing my left hand all the way back to get to that small little eight-inch tom was a pain. So match grip, wow, this makes so much more sense. So I was working on finger control. I was working on you know the Billy Cobham types of of you know wrist things and and working on drumline stuff and kind of doing my own. I was studying with Steve Houghton at the time, and I'd watch him play, and he kind of closed up the space there between you know i had my fulcrum between my thumb and the first line of my index i kind of closed that that little gap there that we have some people have it wide open when you start playing louder that gap as you know you go back with a down with a backbeat like i used with david lee roth that's gonna go right into the webbing so i was experimenting getting my own kind of version of what worked for me with match grip but in answer to your question specifically the finger technique and and, uh, and a right symbol pattern that went from fives. When you say five, do you mean dig a dig a da? Thing dig a dig thing. One two three four five. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. He was doing. Uh, there were a lot yeah. of phrasings like threes, twos, and fives. Yeah, dig a dig a dig a dig a dig a dig a dig Yeah. Absolutely. I did a lot of that. By the way, he st- he he did that at that era and then he he didn't do it anymore. He he made fun of it because he there's a lot of con like he he'd um come back and say like, Oh, that's you know, that's silly. Why would anybody do that after he kind of established that when I took lessons from him? Well, so Rob, this is that. super interesting because I never talked to anybody about this. I want to know more about that. But one thing I did in one of the times we were playing, you know how his hi hat would just because we were playing quarters on and his hi hat. Well, he's going sound to get down, sound to get down, sound to get down, sound to get down, sound to get down. And his hi hat, if it was loose on the on the clutch, she would be going fit, 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 fit. And I played like that, and I said, Leo, like you do. And he goes, I don't do that. I said, What do you mean? Yeah, you do. He goes, No, I don't. I don't do that. Maybe he meant I don't do that anymore. But on that last blue note thing that he did with Wallace Rooney and Mo Miller, I thought he was. I got to look at it again, but I thought he was doing it. Then. So he, he maybe was to do a new kind of playing where the fives and the threes and the finger technique and the quarter notes with the high end. He wasn't doing it much. So he kind of went into denial saying, I don't do that. What do you think? Yeah, well, um, another part of my lesson. So we, we we did, you know, I'm I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he was in uh, this place called Pacifica, which yeah, is, I went to uh, his house for lessons. That's you went to his house, so it's about thirty minutes from the city, um, and 
Um, you know, he uh, came to this place called SIR Recording, and of course, in downtown San Francisco, and uh, drove his Ferrari or whatever it was at the time, and um, we do the group lessons. So we signed up from the group lessons at this place called Bay Jones, which is a club uh, in in the Mission in San Francisco. Um, so. Um, we were doing like, like flam taps. I'll never forget this. And he says, do not bounce at all, ever bounce. You cannot bounce. So you use the back of your fingers and then you do like, black it to 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 black it to. And he goes, do not bounce. He goes, I never bounce. But he do these, you know, his hand stuff is like, what? You know, it's, it's beyond anything where he just does like hand technique and he, he, he has to be bouncing. Otherwise he'd kill himself. But I agree. I agree. So in other words, he's he's doing, you know, right flam, like left, right, right, left, right, right, uh, left, right, right, left, wait a minute. I, I, I'm bad with spelling it up. Left, right, there's the flam. It's a right flam. Left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left. Oh, not the triplet. It's the uh, it's a flam, left, right, flam, right, left, flam, left, right. Alternating. Right. Yeah, it's the it's the flam accent. Gotcha. Alternating flam, flam taps, I guess they're called. Yeah. Um, no finger, no bounce. No. Well, only he would say he would say no bounce. Only wrist. Only wrist, and he'd he look at you, and you're getting the sticking right, and and then you know it's like, yeah, I'm doing it right. I've been doing it forever, and it's like, no, don't bounce. So. Um, you know, it was one of those things that uh, he contradicted himself, you know, but maybe you're right. right. Maybe, maybe it was um, something that he moved on, like he went through these different eras and he didn't want to go back to what he did before. Right. He was moving into more, um, you know, uh, like when I studied with him, it was like the quartet stuff and the trio stuff. Was, what year did you study with him? Uh, 94. Yeah, me too. And he asked me, um, what 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 was the date that he passed? Oh, uh, uh, ninety seven, and I I have to look it up. Yeah, well, ninety seven. So I think mine were ninety four as well, and I think it would have been around because he used to come to L.A. and he used to call me. I remember picking him up at the airport. We'd go hang, and there was one event that I that we went to together, and we sat together. It was a it was a miles. Uh, foundation event concert thing and we sat together there and, and um, he invited me down to to ocean way or maybe it was uh ocean or maybe it was east west one of those two studios there but anyway he invited me there i think it was ocean way he was recording on a hendrix tribute album and he re invited me to just to, to, to check out that but um uh he told he asked me over the phone one time if i knew about lyle workman and now of course lyle is one of my best friends i've done a million movies with lyle where he's a great guitar player he plays with sting he played with todd rundgren he played with tony but he i've done movies like 40 year old virgin super bad forgetting sarah marshall all kinds of stuff recording with lyle but um i said no i don't know about lyle workman and he goes yeah man he's He's from up around here. I think Lyle's from San Jose. I'm not sure. But anyway, he said, he's incredible. Then I didn't get to know Lyle until later, but he was putting together that group that he said he wanted it to be like a cross between Metallica and Lifetime. And he was asking me, I was with Zildjian at the time. Now I'm with Sabian. And he said, you know, what are other drummers using Zildjian wise, like metal drummers, rock drummers? And I said, why do you want to know that? He goes, I just want to know because I, I've got this new band, you know, that I'm putting together. And I said, Tony, you're the guy with the, with the K's, with the vintage K's. He goes, you want it? I said, I said four or more. He goes, you want to see that symbol? you got it? Yeah, come on out. We went out, out of his drum room in the back guest house. We went into his garage. And Rob, he, he grabbed it from a corner. And he showed me. And it was a spring. He said, Max gave me this. He said, man, if you're going to hit this, hit it. You know, and I did. And it was just worn. It was a spring. Now, I said, that's that symbol. Anyway, he he didn't want that. Like you're saying, he was into new stuff. He was always into growing, you know. He wanted new stuff. So I started telling him about these symbols that were the furthest thing from what 
I ever looked in pawn shops for or tried to get because I wanted old K's. We all did, you know. So anyway, I couldn't figure out why he wanted to do that, but he felt that he needed symbols that were more like the, the metal guys to project through all the amps and stuff. But then he also, he had that DW kit, with, you know, the yellow with the red hardware, and it was a double bass kit, and he was really into double bass. And uh, he was just telling me that he went, you know, he started upping the sizes because, you know, when when uh, when the Beatles came out, you know, I know Ringo went from a 20 to a 22 and then Ringo went from a 22 to a 24 because John Bonham was one of his best friends. And I know Tony liked Led Zeppelin. He loved he loved Led Zeppelin. He loved the Beatles. We t- talked about that a lot before i was up in san francisco area not san francisco i forget where this place is but it's a great studio called the site have you heard of that place no beautiful beautiful studio up in the i don't know i'm an la guy so i don't know that exact where that studio was big huge glass window you could just see the mountains and my brother and i were brought up there by joe satriani for a week to do an album and my friend jay rubin brought a truck and my dad too my dad was a, a jazz drummer but he also teched for me they brought a u-haul truck with like 10 kits in it because joe said yeah we went we might, we, might, we might want a little bebop kit or like a ringo kit or like a bottom kit or a Hal Blaine kind of kit, you know, or this kind of kit or that kind of kit, or maybe the kit you used on the extremist with Andy John's engineering. Cause this was John Cuda birdie engineering. Anyway, I had this truck there, this U-Haul truck at the site, the studio called the site with all these drum sets. And I had a rent a car and I was driving to Pacifica. So I thought I'll throw my little 18 inch bebop kit in there. Maybe Tony will let me set it up and we could play some double drums. So, I knock on the door. Colleen answers. She says, yeah, Tony's in the back in the guest house. Go on back. So I go back there. And we're hanging out. And I said, Tony, I said, I'm doing this album with Joe Satriani. And he goes, oh, yeah, I've heard of him. I go, yeah, he's a great rock guitar player. Really great, well-rounded guitar player. I said, I got a little 18-inch bebop kit in my rent car Can I bring it in? And we can play some double drums. And he goes, oh, let's just use this kit. We'll get on and off this, you know, my big DW kit here. And I pushed it a little bit. And I said, it would be really awesome. And just take me a second. You could just hang out, you know, smoke your cigar, which I could not stand to this day. One of the smells that I absolutely hate the most is cigar smoke. People, they think it's really hip now. Yeah, we're all going to go out in the back of this club and smoke cigars. And get me the hell away from you guys. That smells like somebody farted and did a Dutch oven or something. I said, I don't want to be. So he's in there smoking his cigar. And I'm like, oh, I hated that smell. But it was Tony Williams. So I go, you can hang out and smoke your cigar. I'll go get it. He goes, if you really want to, go get it. So I went out and got it. I'm bringing it in. It was, I took it out of the cases. Had the cymbal stands all set up. I said a little 18, 12, 14. A really great sounding K and a K crash and some K hats. And he goes, well, let's just play. So I'm recording this. I don't know if it was cassette or if it was that. And we played for about 20 minutes, man. And I was just freaking going. I'm playing. Playing all this stuff with Tony Williams, man. And uh, afterwards, I'm thinking, what's he going to say? I was a little bit, you know, nervous because anyway, he said, that was fun, man. He goes, I haven't done that since 1963 with Max. I'm going, you haven't played double drums with anybody since 63 with Max? And I just played double drums with you. So excuse me for telling long stories. Do I have a little more time to go on about this? Go on, man. I love it. Okay. So anyway, we do that. And then I, I do something like, I just want to get his opinion, you know, because we talked about a lot of different drummers, drummers that were before him with Miles, drummers that were after him with Miles, this guy, that guy, the other guy. And I don't want to get into his opinions of people, because as you know, Rob, he had a lot of opinions. We didn't talk a lot about grip, maybe in the very first time I met him, we did. And I'll get into that too. Well, let me start with that because here we go. So, I'm sorry this is turning into a monologue, but um, Mark Cranny was one of my best friends. Mark was the drummer on Gino Vanelli, brother to brother. We were roommates. We were great pals. And a very good friend of Mark's from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, or maybe in Minneapolis area, 
was Colleen, Tony's wife. But this is back in like high school, college times. Mark and Colleen knew each other from way back then. So I'm up doing some clinic or something in San Francisco, maybe 90, end of 93 or maybe beginning of 94. I forget when the time was I called Tony. But I looked at the back of Bay Area Magazine, BAM Magazine, and I see this little dinky, small, little, like one inch by an inch and a half ad, Tony Williams accepting private drum students. I'm going, what? So I got home and I called on my landline. You know, and I called and it was a message on a voice machine, voice no, machine, voice machine, tape machine, as we call them. So I go, Tony, hey, this is a drummer in Los Angeles, Greg this and that. I'm a huge fan of yours. And I just saw your ad in Bam Magazine. I'd love to come up and take lessons with you. I live in L.A. I'll fly up. Anyway, here's my number. And I go to our grocery store, Ralph's, what a corny name for a grocery store, like Ralph, like you're going to throw up. I go to Ralph's and I come back from Ralph's and my, my, my phone machine, Rob, is blinking, blink, blink, blink. I'm going, oh, I got a lot of messages. The first one I play, hey, Greg, it's Tony Williams. Uh, I'm playing it back and he says, man, I'm all filled up with students at the place where I'm teaching. But my wife, Colleen, she said, that she heard from her friend, Mark Cranny, you're a really good guy. So come on up. I call him back and I go, wow, man, thank you for finding the slide. He goes, well, I got to tell you, man, I don't know if it's cool with you, but it's a hundred bucks an hour. And I said, a hundred bucks an hour. My tax guy's 300 an hour. I don't even want to go to my tax guy. You're Tony Williams. Can I take three the first day? He goes, come on up. He goes, we don't have any more space in this place I'm teaching, but we can meet someone. So I book a hotel room, not far from wherever he's teaching. And he goes, I want to do the first lesson just on a couple pads. So I take two real film pads and two snare stands, put them in my suitcase, fly to Oakland, rent a car, go to this place, wherever it was, this, like, I think it was like an embassy suites or Hampton Inn or something. And I get a room and I got, you know, two pads there, two chairs, and he gives me his version of the way he holds his stick for about, I don't know, 10 minutes. And then we just talked about music for the rest of the hour. And he goes, man, I dig you, man. I like hanging out with you. You're a cool guy. Come to my house for the next one. So all the other lessons throughout that year or two were at his house. So anyway, back to Colleen letting me back in that room and I set up and we play. And he's he had shown me the Tony Williams K at another lesson, but we're playing. And um, I decide to just do my version of what I think Elvin would do. Maybe I'm Wayne Shorter, Night Dreamer. Trying to Elvin out, just seeing what Tony Williams is going to say. I go, what, what do you think about this? Like, if I did something like that, he goes, that sounds like you're trying to sound like Elvin. You know, I said, that's cool. It sounds good. But he goes, you got to try to sound like you. Now, in my lessons with David Garibaldi, when I first moved to LA from, I grew up in Detroit. And I went to school at North Texas and I moved out to L.A. in 82. They, I said, how'd you get your sound? How did you do the whole Tower of Power David Garibaldi sound? He goes, he lines up like six or seven albums. He goes, I digested those fully. And then when I really digested them, when I played, influence of the influences of those things came up with my own soul. And I know that's what Tony did. He might say, yeah, don't try to play like Elvin. But I know he probably tried to play like a lot of his predecessors, but then he just, he ingested it, whether it was Alan Dawson or Philly Joe Jones or whoever, and they spit it out in his own way, right? So I go, okay, cool, you know. So then he started talking about how, you know, you should try to play the ride at one volume and then play the snare real soft and then play the snare real loud and then keep the ride going here, mix up the volume of the bass drum and snare drum, but never change the hat and the snare and the kick volume. And we did a lot of that kind of stuff, but we talked a lot about he would ask me, why do I sit so low? And I'd say, well, I don't know. I guess I sit low because I see Vinny Kaliuta sit low or Steve Dad kind of sit low. And he'd go, I think you should sit high and you should be the king of your drums. You, know, you don't want to, you know, the drum, people are afraid of drums, he'd say. People are afraid of drums, even in the old days with the 
you know, the RCA Victor dog in the cone. They put the clarinet right next to the cone. They put the drums way in the back because people are afraid of drums, right? So anyway, that was cool to hear him say that. But he said to me one time, Rob, he goes, hey, I know that you do a lot of recording in L.A. And uh, I'd like to come down to L.A. and do some sessions. And he asked me, could you help me get in with some producers? And, you know, I said, are you kidding me? Does Dolly Parton sleep on her back? Yes, you're Tony Williams. People would jump at the chance. But I said, Tony, I got to ask you a weird question. He goes, what? I said, if somebody wanted you to cut a hole in your bass drum and stuff it with a couple of pillows or put a packing blanket in there, or maybe even take the front head off because they want to do a sound like Don Henley with the Eagles at a, where they hear a lot of attack, tune the bass drum really low, would you do that? And he goes, no way. I said, well, your snare, you know, with the dot, you know, and brrr, can, 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 if they wanted it really cranked up super high, like that Stuart Copeland, gang, gang, or they wanted you to tune it super, super, super low, so it's almost bubbling, but they, you just cover it with duct tape around the sides, and it goes, doof, like, again, like Don Henley, or like Jeff Lynn, ELO, or that kind of Jim Keltner early said that doof, doof, um, would, would you be into that? And he goes, no way, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> he said, forget it. So anyway, that ended that conversation. He just, he said, this is my sound. Now, Narada Michael Walden told me not long ago that he was producing an album and he hired Tony and he asked Tony if they could put a little bit of like a towel in his kick drum. He kept both heads on there, but a little bit of dampening. And I said, oh no, he probably said no, right? He said, he let me do it. He was cool. And it did make it more like a little bit more funk sounding than just boom, you know. So anyway, the can I just say one more thing before I your next question? Go ahead. So he evidently was called um, by Zildjian to do a clinic. And the clinic was up in the Bay Area. I, I actually have the backstage pass from that actual clinic. Here's a photo of the two of us right here. Wow. Yeah, we did that clinic together. And um, I have a backstage pass that will say the name of the store we did it at. And it is in here. I thought it was Lemon, L-E-M-O-N. Oh, here we go. Lemon Percussion presents an evening with drum legends. Man, putting my name next to his is a drum legend. You got to be kidding. Tony Williams and I, Santa Clara University, May 3rd, 1996. Okay, so anyway, I get this call from Zildjian saying Tony's booked to do a clinic with Max Roach, but Max couldn't do it. And they were sending Steve Smith to do it. Steve, I think had a vital information tour or something came up and he couldn't do it. And, and uh, Zildjian, I think it was John De Christopher said, Tony said he'd still do the clinic if you would do it with him. Cause you guys are really good friends and he likes your playing. And blah, blah. I go, Tony wants to do Wants me to be on a clinic with him? He goes, I, yeah, okay. So I did it. And before my dad comes in the room and he goes, hey, Gareth, Scott Garrison, Tony's tech, told me that Tony had some info for me. And I said, what info, dad? He said, make sure to tell um, Garrison. No, 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 here's how the story went. <laughs> Garrison said, Tony told me to go out with a knife and cut a hole in the batter head of your bass drum. I'm like, oh, that's so fun. like sabotage it. So T Tony wants to see you real quick before the clinic. So I go in his room and he's, of course, smoking a cigar, his dressing room. He goes, Hey, man, um, I'm going to go on first and you're going to follow me. I said, No way. I, Louis Belson once told me, never follow a kid or a dog act. I said, I'm not following Tony Williams. He goes, no, don't feel bad that I'm not hanging out to hear you play. I know how you play. He goes, but I'm going to go on first, and then I'm going to take off. I got the limo waiting. I'm going to get home, and you're going to follow me. I said, really? And he goes, really? Here I go. So he goes out and plays first. I'm going, this is this is intimidating, right? So then after he plays, I'm warming up and getting ready to go on. And Will Kennedy, I think, 
had driven up from LA for this thing. I'm not positive. He goes, hey, Craig, I got here a little late, man, traffic. And he goes, what time does Tony go on? I go, well, he's just left. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry I blabbed for so long and didn't even let you get a word in, Rob. Go ahead. No, I, it's it's beautiful to hear these stories, and and I, I I love your energy, and you know all the stuff that you, which is so incredible. Like you're you're in the mecca of like all this this stuff that happened, you know, and uh, even with with Ringo and everything, like you know we're figuring out that Ringo is kind of the reason why we all play. Uh, Tony loved Ringo. Tony told me I have posters of the Beatles in my New York apartment and like Miles. He had these these posters because I love the Beatles, you know. So in a way, like these experiences that you get to 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 um, have with like you know history, you know, like the drumming history of how everything happened, you know. And I think this is another part of it. And, you know, I've been studying with Steve Smith when I was when I was uh, um, out of Berkeley. I went to Berkeley College of Music in um, uh, uh, 80 to 84. I graduated. I came back. There was a club called um, Kimball's West. What so city is that? Uh, San Francisco. Kimball's West. Okay. On, uh, if you know the city, it's Franklin and Grove. Yeah, I know. I know That's that. Jazz is like around the, a block, a block down the street. So I go there and it'd be Alphonse Mozan, it'd be all these great people. And so it was Tony with uh, John Handy. So I go there and, and uh, who's hanging out? Steve Smith and a guy, Michael, and I always say his last name wrong, but um, he played with Eddie Jobson. Barcimentano. Ba oh, Mike Barcimento. Yeah, thank Mike Barcimento. Yeah, he's Barcimento. a good friend of mine. So they're hanging out, and and I was into that uh, uh, Eddie Jobs, and I'm like, oh man, I love your playing, man, Eddie. It's like all the odd time stuff and linear playing, and and, and yeah. checking out Tony, and I had been studying with this guy uh, Gary Chafee. Which sure, I know Gary very well. I've done clinics with Gary. We're good friends. He's awesome. Yeah. So so I told Steve, I go, Steve. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm doing like the, the time feel concepts and it was like linear playing and all the, the stuff Gary had come out because when Steve studied with him, he was just doing like polyrhythm stuff and, and stickings. Right. So, uh, so, so from that Tony, that Tony uh, uh, gig, you know, uh, concert, I, I was lifelong friends with Stevie uh, invited me to the house and it was like a couple guys and he was going through the journey thing where they were, you know, going through that whole, like, um, nobody could play for years. Like, you know, yet you're on contract. So you couldn't play. You was at home practicing. So, you know, we had these lessons all day long. And, um, so like Tony was kind of the, the, you know, glue to all that happening. And he would play a lot in little clubs in the city, you know, so we go out and see him play. And, and I remember I was in high school, there's a place called Keystone Corner. It was a big jazz place. And I remember being like 17 years old and just being, Tony walked out, he'd walk in with his cymbal bag and it was Tony Williams. Oh my God. I'm a big fan. And he'd just laugh, you know, and yeah, his, his, his jumpsuit on, I think it was Bunny Burnell and they yeah. kind of, you know, straight ahead and fusion and stuff. So, yeah. um, you know, it was, it was really amazing. And, um, you know, when, when that same thing happened, I mean, the first thing I was telling you about the sign up sheet at, at Bay Jones, there was the, uh, the ad and, and, and Bam magazine. Well, so, you saw that ad too, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and then you call and you leave a message and he call back. <laughs> yeah. We did. I don't even, it was like almost pre answering machine. Like answering machines were maybe just starting. <laughs> you can imagine that. <laughs> like you'd, you'd answer the phone, right? And so you would, answer, you would pick up. Oh, exactly. So, um, so in your lessons, so did you do like, did you just go up and do like that day or did you, did you go back? Oh, no, I went up there a lot. I flew up there every chance I got. I just took a flight from Burbank airport. I live up in, I was in Woodland Hills at the time. I'm a little further up Thousand Oaks kind of area now, but I just go to Burbank, leave my car fly to Oakland for some reason, get a rent a car in Oakland and drive to Pacifica and just hang out and take a lesson. And um, 
after the lesson, you know, we'd tell stories. And yeah, I knew that he loved Ringo. I knew that he loved the Beatles. Um, I knew that he loved rock, you know. I remember asking him, Tony, you were seven, excuse me, you were 17 years old, man. Were you intimidated playing with Miles? And he goes, no, man, I was too, too young and full of, you know, vim and vigor or whatever you want to call it to be to be nervous i was just like let's go he said it's not till you get a little older in your 30s your 40s your 50s what did he what did he pass that rob 53 51 51 in 1997 so then he was 17 when he played with miles right correct and, yeah and he just said it's not till you get a little older where you start worrying about what you know how am I doing with this? Or you get a little insecure, you know, who's in the club, you know, who am I playing for? He said, I was 17. He's, he said once Miles would say, hey, give me some of that. Baka, baka, baka. He'd say, oh yeah, baka, baka, baka. take this. And baka, 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 baka. You know, he said he was just full of just like, oh, yeah, testosterone, Roy, raw, raw energy, you know. So we talked about that. We talked about, um, Kind of one thing he did say a lot is that, um, you know, with Herbie, especially as his, you know, guy that was like he said, Herbie would play some kind of rhythm. And he said, instead of just jumping on that rhythm and playing it with him, he said, you know, I wanted to try to not be a reactor, not just reacting to jumping on that rhythm, but I would get my own rhythm that could work alongside it and run parallel to that so you know it, 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 they would they would run in two different universes a lot of times playing over the bar patterns and i thought that is really composition he was often just sitting by that piano and his did you ever go to his house with the guest house with the piano in it no i didn't get to i was just at the uh, this place called drum world drum world yeah yeah that's where he said he was filled up with lessons but I could come to his house, right? So he, I'd come over and he'd usually be sitting on the piano because he was taking lessons on theory and composition, I guess it was, taking lessons. You know, another thing that cracks me up is, you know, we talked about brushes and he goes, look, man, he goes, I play a clear head on my stair with a dot, you know, he goes, and I don't have sizzles in my cymbals. So, you know, brushes... I think they were invented by a frustrated club owner. But on the Wilderness album, doesn't he play a lot of brushes? Yeah. And, you know, what he told me and when I took lessons is he said he had a special snare drum for brushes. Okay, and, there you and, go. Um, he played differently. And, you know, and he's going back to the contradictory thing. Uh, I have a clinic. Now, when I was at Berkeley, there was a place called Wurlitzer Music, which was down the street. I've been there and back in the 70s and 80s, yeah. Right. So um, they had all these artists. Zildjian had put on everybody, right? So Simon Phillips, Peter Erskine, uh, Tony, um, uh, who else was it? Um, Lenny White. You know, it's just this, like, just, you know, amazing clinics. Yeah. And so he played brush and he goes, he was talking about how he played brushes differently and getting a different textures and how it was so much different than playing with sticks. So, um, he had all yeah. this technique. And then I asked him in the lesson, oh, uh, Elvin Jones is a great brush player. And he goes, uh, no, uh, I think it was Kenny Clark is the great brush player. He kind of corrected me there. And I yeah. remember Max versus Rich was, was somebody had given him that record. He goes, isn't that a great, isn't that a great shot? You know, of who? Max and Max, 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 Max. it was Max versus Roach. Or sorry, oh, a rich versus Roach. Excuse me. Yeah, right. I remember that album. So, so he he just you know he was looking at you. What a great shot, you know. Um, so I think that he had you know like he had all those you know um, different kinds of experiences and and um, what what I gathered from him what he told me is the way that he learned is is from going to clubs and and yeah. everybody out and and listening and. Yeah. Um, and sitting in, and then, um, you know, he he did talk about studying with Alan Dawson, but only for reading, he said. Only for oh, reading. Is that right? Now, did he go to the Berkeley campus, or was it at a music store, or did he go to Alan's house? What was that all about? Uh, he didn't specifically say. Okay, uh, but, but only for reading. That's what he told me. He goes, I only went for reading. Now, there is a little story, and I don't want to get too into it, because it's, you know, I don't want to be negative, but... 
there was a, a certain drummer that was very famous in the Bay Area. And I was doing a gig with somebody who said, oh, this guy uh, taught Tony Williams. And, uh, and I told Tony, I made the mistake of telling Tony, and he got pretty upset. Yeah. He goes, let me tell you something. You know, this guy is not musical. You know, this guy doesn't, you know, he, he, he teaches technique, but he can't play. And he went off yeah. for about a half an hour, you know. Right. And I go, okay. Yeah, he was very opinionated, and he was not afraid to let you know his opinions. And I've, I've never really said a lot of the things uh, that he told me because of that one incident where I, you know, I never wanted to make a cassette of of anything he taught me because that was my lesson. But yeah, Rob, I know you don't want to, you don't want to pass on those things he said because he. He told them to us as students, and 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 it's kind of awkward. But yeah, he definitely had opinions, right? Right. And uh, he, he, when you got on a good day with him, and this is my experience, he was the most beautiful cat ever. When, when he was, he was kind of relaxed and, 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 and he would open up, but he would have that other side to him too, where he, you know, uh, maybe more defensive, you know, uh, yeah. or, or, you know, uh, somebody would do something and he would get angry. You know, he wasn't, um, he wasn't afraid to show that. And he told me he got that from his mother. He says, you know, I don't let people put their sax cases on my cases because I won't have it. He goes, I didn't get that from playing music. I got that from my mother. That was what my mother taught me. I don't take shit from anybody. Yeah. Yeah, I remember one time we went to, uh, I picked him up at the airport. It's funny because I remember saying to, my, to him, hey, this is my dad's car. It was a Lincoln, you know, and my dad wouldn't let my mom smoke in the Lincoln. My mom still was a smoker. My dad quit smoking in the 60s. But my mom, up till right before she passed in 2006, she smoked cigarettes. And my dad quit smoking probably in 1964, 65, but then he passed in 2008. And my dad would not let my mom smoke in this car, even on long trips. So I pick up Tony from the airport, and it's a, it's a car, it's a Lincoln, you know, Continental. But he got in the back seat. I'm going, wow, why is Tony getting in the back seat? He said, I'm not a limo driver, I'm his friend, you know. And we're talking and hanging out, and I go, yeah, just do me a favor, this is my dad's car. He didn't even let my mom smoke, so please don't smoke in here. And a minute later, he starts smoking a cigar in that Lincoln, and I'm going, that's not cool, man. So I, I aired that car out. I brushed the ashes off the seat because it was black kind of um, velour seats on like a 1989 Lincoln, you know. But anyway, I just thought that was really weird, man, that he did that. And I didn't, I didn't like it, but I'm going, well, you know, it's Tony. And uh, so I just let that go. But I, I know what you mean about when he... I never saw him on a bad day where he was like really carrying on or ever yelling or getting, but there was one time that we, I think it might have even been that time. And maybe it was one of those days, right? So we went to this jazz club with a bunch of very rich people. You could just tell. And um, they had these seats, you know, by the stage to watch some kind of a Miles tribute thing. And uh, he just sat down there and said, sit here. And some lady came over and said, oh, uh, these seats are reserved. And he just, I'm Tony Williams, and I'm sitting here. And this is my friend Greg, and he's sitting there. You know, go go get the manager if you want to give me a problem with this. You know, he like you said, he wasn't going to take grief from anybody. He wanted to do what he wanted to do, right? Yeah. And that was the beauty of it. But those two, the uh, the two sides of him. That I, you know, you probably experienced it more than me, but what I experienced was, you know, hey, you guys, you know, like encouraging us and everybody's doing really well and, and opening up and, and, you know, he gave me the whole history of the fusion. Cause when I grew up, like there was an album called Stanley Clark. And my brother, I have an older brother, is five years older, and he would play that Stanley. We had turntables, and he that Stanley Clark record, and he J, we had JBL speakers, which were really big in the day. And I just fell in love with that album. And there was a side B, I think it was the uh, uh, Sweet, uh, and it was like um, like he played like um, 
uh, bowed, bowed upright bass, and there was all these different sections like uh, movements. And yeah. that one section where you're playing the solo and the snares are off. Oh, Tony's on that Stanley album. He's on that Stanley album. Yeah. And I just, that was my, that was my thing, man. I, that was, like, yeah. I fell in love with it, you know? You know, what's funny, Rob, is I remember talking to him about different sessions and playing. And he goes, you know, people, people hire me a lot to play on their albums and stuff, you know, jazz albums. And he said, and they want me to play the way I played with Miles. And he goes, I try to tell them, man, look, and this was kind of bold, but he said, I can't create in a vacuum. He said, give me Ron Carter. Give me Herbie Hancock. Give me George Coleman or Wayne Shorter. Give me Miles. And I can play like that. Well, I mean, we know from many, many other VSOP, his other quintets, quartets, and and, and Chick Corea, I mean, not Chick Corea, God rest his soul, uh, um, McCoy Tyner Super Trios. Hey, man. That's, I mean, yeah, there was Ron, I think it's Ron Carter and Tony and McCoy on one, on one album. I think the other one's Dijonet and Eddie Gomez and McCoy on the other double album. Yeah. But it, yeah, he played like Tony, you know, with more open rock sounding drums with the, you know, probably the Gretsch kit with the Black Dots. And all. But anyway, so yeah, you said, I can't create in a vacuum. I thought, man, I would never have the nerve. If somebody's paying me, which they do all the time. Thank God, even with the lockdown crap, you know, I have my drums in a studio. People send us files. My favorite engineer gets all the drum sounds, mics them up. We play a track. We send them back. They send PayPal. And, you know, I'm just honored that people want me to play on their album and I'll play however they want me to play. That's what a session musician does. I, I don't go, well, I need to play my things on there. I don't care how my drums are tuned either. I like all different drum sounds. I like a Stuart Copeland snare that goes bang. I like the Don Henley Desperado doof or Jeff Lynn don't bring me down. Doof. I like the Beatles more than I love bebop. I have to say, I'm just being honest. I love bebop, but four and more would be under the Beatles albums because I love the Beatles that much and I've talked to Ringo a little bit about Tony he's aware of Tony and I talked to Ringo a little bit about Tony a little bit about Ringo so there's this mutual admiration and respect but the thing is I I love getting different kinds of drum sounds I love playing different beats and if somebody has their plastic drums program to go I will chart that out and learn it and the first take, I'll try to play that with my drums, my cymbals, this room with these mics. But the second take, I'll give them what I would do if it was my band. The third take, I'll give them kind of a wilder version. So they have all that to choose from because I am a people pleaser. I come from a family where my dad was a band leader and my dad met Tony and he hung out with Tony and they, they enjoyed each other's company. They were making jokes. And, you know, my dad knew even though I was way more into Tony than my, my dad was more like the Stan Getz. I don't mean Captain Marvel, like Tony kind of stuff, but I mean like Stan Getz, like girl from Ipanema, uh, Woody Herman, uh, the, you know, like Count Basie, my dad and mom took me to see Count Basie's band, Buddy Rich, Gene Krupa, Louis Belson, um, you know, Tony, Max, Elvin, but not deep into the Coltrane kind of out stuff. So I told my dad, hey, man, we're going to do this thing and you're going to meet Tony. So they were super nice. Tony was super respectful to my dad. My dad was super cool to, to Tony. But the bottom line is I learned from my dad th this inherent thing. I, I just like making people happy. I don't like being a guy that bums somebody out or says, hey, I'm doing this. I'm tuning my drums this way. I'm playing this. This is me. You hired me to play on your album. You're going to get me. No. And I work a lot because I love doing things that make people happy. And I like getting the check, putting the check in the, ma in the bank, and it clears. And I go, maybe they'll call me again. And they usually do because they know I want to make them happy. That's not Tony. Tony was not about that in the tuning sense. And you know all this, Rob, but I'm saying this for the podcast in the tuning sense or in the playing sense, he wanted to do his thing. So I would never in a million years, even if it was a live bebop session, and I've been on live bebop sessions where the bass player gets lost and rushes and drags and the piano player can't find one and rushes and drags and the sax player 
is honking and squeaking, but I'm having a ball and I'm playing music because I could be digging ditches and I'm being paid to play the drums. It's funny. Um, I, I read an article in Modern Drummer once, and I think it was Jim Keltner was being asked, are there sessions you don't do? And he said, man, I did a Pampers commercial or something like that last week. And I got there. And my drums were all set up by my cartage guy, you know, like my Scott Garrison or my dad. And I hung out and had a coffee, talked with a bunch of friends of mine, talked about the latest movies we saw, this new album by so-and-so. And then we played for about a half hour and I got paid. He said, why would I ever turn down a session? And then, you, and then it goes through the union, so you get residuals, and that goes into your pension. So I'm from that union player or non-union, you know. But anyway, I get a pension from the union every month. And I, I, get a two, I get twice a year, I get two big checks from the union. One is for albums you played on royalties, and the, they're called special payments fund. And the other is from TV film. And TV film is always a lot bigger because they negotiated better. But I just love doing sessions. I More than anything, I like playing live. And more than any gig I've ever had. I like playing with Ringo. I've been working with Ringo since 2003 and Ringo on the Roundheads in Ringo's All-Star Band since 2008. So 13 years now in the All-Star Band and then 18 years, you know, with the Roundheads and the All-Star Band. Come on. Five feet away is my the guy that made me want to play in a band just like Tony had the Beatles on his. So did I. And I saw them. I had Sullivan. I even saw them live. My dad took me to see the Beatles live. I'm 61. I was six years. I was six, seven years old in 1966 when they came and played in Detroit. So the Beatles, boom, number one, and everything else falls into place after that. But anyway, that's just a little bit of kind of where I'm at with, you know, being a drummer for hire but but i just love that i love i love playing with ringo because i get to watch my hero and see where he puts his kick and his snare and just getting into that ringo pocket but i write notes on the form he doesn't want to be bothered with a lot of the crazy form stuff so i'll raise my hand or cue him or an eyebrow and he goes thanks for cueing me brother i just want to have fun <laughs> well he uh you know what a legend you know uh yes i was telling you before and uh I didn't realize it, um, but you know when um, in this podcast that um, that that uh, they talk about like all the influences and the drum set. So I wanted a Ludwig drum set because you know Ringo had the Ludwig drum set. So we right. went to a, a store in San Mateo, which is a uh, you know uh, the Peninsula uh, 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 City, and there was a little drum shop or a music shop, and the and the head said Ludwig. You know, oh, it's, there you go. it's all you needed, right? It wasn't though. It was a Japanese cheapo. Oh, gotcha. We gotcha. bought. My dad bought it for me. I still have the bass drum, you know, and it's 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 called stencil drums. But you know, that was the thing. Is like anything that kind of resembled that is a black or uh, pearl uh, oyster pearl. Right. Pearl, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so that that's that's kind of the influence. So to me. You know, um, the the you know, kind of where everything came from was was that, and, and I, I agree. What what your you know take on things? Uh, I was always taught to do everything. My teacher told me to just do everything you can, just play everything you can, and that's Absolutely. what I did. My I took dude. every. I did funeral marches, man, with a bass. Yeah. And I did everything. You know, I could. Yeah, uh, yeah me too. Me too, Rob. So, so I think you know you're, and I actually went through that. I'm, I'm copying all VHS tapes, and I saw that uh, you did the Buddy Rich Memorial concert. You know, you did all these great things, and I think you've been blessed with just you know um, being a people pleaser, and and um, you know all these great experiences and 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 um, things that happen in your life, which is so inspiring. And you're a great right. player. I mean. Well, just, if you're, I remember the video. You had a video out. What was it in the '80s? Private lesson, and then oh. playing, following with the band, and then the last one. These are all with Hudson Music. The last one is musical drumming in different styles. Yeah, three of them. Yeah. Oh, they're great. Uh, I love. Well, you mentioned a word. Thank you very, very much for that. Blessed, blessed is the word. I'm a Christian guy. I've always believed in prayer. People say, "Well, how can you pray for gigs? You're only supposed to pay, pray for." people that don't have any food and people that are dying. I say, I do pray for people that don't have food and I do pray for people that are dying. But I also know that 
I'm taught in the Bible to pray, ask, and knock, and the door, you know, knock, and it shall be open. Ask, and you will receive. If it's God's will, I have no problem praying for the Maynard Ferguson gig. And God gave me the, 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 the ability to play, and great parents It took me to lessons at a great college where I learned a lot about big band and the opportunity to be at the right place at the right time and get the Maynard gig. But that's not all just by chance. I prayed about that. I prayed, I don't want to be labeled as a jazz big band guy after Maynard's band. Please, God, help me get a gig in Jesus' name, like Journey or uh, Phil Collins, Genesis, or Van Halen. Well, Steve Smith's in Journey. Phil Collins and Chester are in Genesis. David Lee Roth leaves Van Halen and starts a band, and I get the gig. He had Billy Sheehan first, and then Steve I, and then I got the gig. It's a lot of prayer. So you say the blessings. I also prayed about the Ringo gig. I knew that the All-Star Band went from Jim Keltner and Levon Helm to Simon Kirk from Free and Bad Company to Sheila E. To Zach Starkey, I should say, second. Ringo's son, what a phenomenal drummer, plays in The Who. So, yeah, when Zach was second. But I knew that they were going to be looking for a drummer. And I just love the Beatles. I even had a Beatle tribute band called The Lads. And I got a call to do a session for Steven Tyler. And it was Ringo's producer. And it was midnight. And he goes, hey, we need you on this track. It's a shuffle and it's drum machine. Steven hates the feel. Can you come down here? And I go, I'll be down there at 10 a.m. It's about a half hour, 45 minute drive. He goes, well, we need you now. I said, it's midnight. I'm trying to get my son back to sleep. He had a bad dream. Ringo's drums are still set up in the room. We just finished his fourth album here. You can play his drums. I'll be right there. (laughs) Bolt down the 101. Bolt down the 405. Get there. And I'm not going to get sounds going, oh, here's a kick drum for 10 minutes. Here's my snare. Oh, well, when you hit the tom, the snares are rallying, all that crap. Bruce Sugar, the engineer, recommended me to the producer, Mark Hudson. So I said, Bruce, you know, this is going to be cool with this. I played for about 20 minutes. Every Ringo beat I knew from Come Together to There Are Places I Remember One High Hat for Bar in My Life to the drum solo on the end to Tickets a Ride to Tomorrow Never Knows. And, and Mark comes into the room. He goes, man, I've heard you are a Ringo fanatic. I've heard you go all over the world and do these clinics about tribute to Ringo and why he's your favorite song drummer and that these songs wouldn't be the same without his parts. But you really, you really love his playing. You've really researched it. You really have that feel. He goes, if this, if Ringo's son, Zach, has to go out or goes out, not has to, gets to go out with the Who on tour next month and can't do the Ringo and the Roundheads tour or all these promo things like Letterman, Conan, Craig Ferguson, the Tonight Show, you got the gig. I said, like that? It works like that? He goes, yeah. Ringo will love the fact that I'll tell him how into it. Believe me. Does your brother Matt have a Hofner bass? Because my brother Matt, who plays with Elton John now, he plays with Sir Elton John. I play with Sir Richard Stark. Pretty crazy. But he, I said, yeah. He said, does he have a Hofner? And I said, yeah, he has a Hofner, of course. Tell him he's got the gig too, if you get it. So I get the gig and I go to, my dad comes out. He goes, I set your drums up two feet away from Ringo's Ludwig's and I'm crying and I go in there and Ringo walks in and I go to shake his hand. He goes, I only give hugs. I said, you have no idea what it means to me to be in this band with you. He says, brother, I hear you go around the world doing these seminars, telling people how great I am. You got to be in the band. Wow. That's incredible story. Uh, It's really inspirational, man. Um, Thanks, Rob. I think um, in wrapping up, um, maybe you could uh, give a little bit of, of uh, some things that you got from your lessons with Tony, some things that, that rubbed off on you, um, yeah. inspirations that, that we can pass on to other people. Well, the biggest one, the biggest one, and these are not like you know, technical things that I feel like I'm divulging on lessons I paid for. I think the biggest one that we would just talk about when we weren't even in the lessons, when we were just driving around or going somewhere or going to that session or or going at the clinic before the clinic, we would just talk about how you need to look out into the audience, maybe 50 rows back and see somebody and just pick them out and go, I want to be someone that is not going, 
Yeah, so yesterday I went to McDonald's and I got a... What? Yeah, I got a... He said, I want to be direct with my conversation. I want to look at that person. I want to go... And I want them to know and feel in their heart that I went... He said, it's kind of like you go to Burger King drive through <laughs> and you say, I want a Whopper with cheese and no pickles. But when you get it and you pull over to eat it, you got a Whopper with extra cheese. And, pick, and, and wait a minute, what did I say? A Whopper with cheese and no pickles. You got a Whopper with pickles and no cheese. <laughs> wait a minute, maybe I wasn't clear enough. Could I please? Have a Whopper with extra cheese, but no pickles. Blah, 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 behind everybody. We watch the dynamics. We watch the drama. We watch what's going on. If this person's making a face, oh, this person's soloing too long or, or this, or, you know, whatever it is. We're, drum, as drummers, we're kind of like the musical director in a lot of ways. We're also kind of like the referee. And I think drummers make great producers because we can kind of referee, you know, everything cool, guys. Here, we're going to do this song. This is the tempo I picked. You know, I got it in my little song starter. Don't worry. This is where we like it. This is not the record tempo. It's, it's a little faster, whatever. And you kind of, you set the tempo, you set the mood. And the people person thing about me, that relates to drumming. And Tony's thing, like you said, he's not going to take grief from anybody. So you got to stand up. One thing I try to do, and I tell Drum, young drummers at clinics i say if you're doing a, a song or you're doing a recording or you're in a rehearsal in your middle school or high school or college or whatever and somebody's really messing up and they're messing up your groove a bass player whose girlfriend just broke up with them <laughs> or the guitar player that just went to starbucks and got the triple mocha choca latte yeah yeah and they're like tink -a -tink -a -tink -a -tink -a -tink -a -tink -a Rather than calling them out in front of other people, that's never a good move in any kind of situation. Friends, lunches, dinners, rehearsals, sessions, gigs. Just go, hey, Bob. You know, I'll use the name Bob. Bob, come here for a second. Man, you know, you're, I, I have you off in my phones, bro, because you're really pushing it. I got a loop or a click, and you're just like, here, can you try to, I got to keep you off, and I don't want to, but can you try to just, Play, I'm not saying slow down or lay back per se, but just really be aware of where you're putting it. Oh, cool. Thanks. If you say that to Bob in front of the band, ah, what do you mean, man? Yeah. And that's how all that stuff starts. That's the definition of bullying, making people feel weird in front of other people. Hey, look at this guy. I tripped him on the playground and he fell. He scraped his knee. Nah, 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 nah. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be someone that lifts people up. No, it's great advice. You know, uh, I think we've all had those experiences. Uh, the evil eye, we call it. Um, so I know what you're talking about, you know, and, and it wasn't like uh, somebody pulled you aside. They kind of did it on the bandstand. You know what Maynard would do as opposed to Buddy? Because we were on the road at the same time. Sometimes Buddy would go first. Sometimes we'd go first. Sometimes the other way around. But Buddy would yell and scream at his band, you know, for time issues. Maynard would never say a thing but what told the story was the music so every night he'd have his front house sound guy record this is 1982 83 record a cassette and then he'd put that cassette on on the bus and man we'd have long bus rides and you'd really listen back and you'd hear the issues sax players falling asleep and be adjusting their mouthpieces trumpet players that weren't hitting the triple high e would be going eh, 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 and i'd be going man i'm rushing like crazy or whatever it was and that's the best teacher record the band listen to it that's why session musicians are so great they record they go in and listen they record they go listen when you just play and you got somebody yelling you're rushing you're dragging you're this or that first of all who knows if they're right why are they calling me out in front of anybody else? Let's let the music do the talking, you know?
Yeah. And that's, I think that's the best way uh, to, to uh, judge for yourself. And that's another lesson I had with, with Steve, you know, he, we taped everything. So he got me into taping every gig I did. Uh, yeah. CD disc, we had tape recorder. Um, and, and uh, he goes, be your own judge, you know, yeah. listen to yourself play. Um, and, and let that be, if somebody, somebody's telling you something, it might be their opinion or how they feel things, but listen f- for yourself, be your yeah. own judge. And that Steve really helps. My best friends. I love that guy. I love John Mater. You've got two great friends that are great friends of mine that I respect a lot. And I respect you a lot. I can't wait to here you play. Hey, thank you so much for doing this. So I really, you know, appreciate you taking the time out and, and telling oh. me stories. And it's- well, Rob, I learned a lot from you, and I'm glad we got to talk about some of those uh, those things about uh, contradictions and things that everyone goes through. You know, everyone's trying to grow and change, and and Tony probably was too. So it was wonderful hearing your take on stuff, and I hope we get to hang face to face soon. That'd be great. All right, thank man. You. Have a Thank great you so much. And, uh, we'll be in touch, okay? Uh, sounds great, Rob. Thanks uh, a lot, buddy. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Please check out my website, robhartdrumstudio.com, and there you can sign up to my mailing list to get the latest content when it drops. You can also sign up to get a free introductory lesson. Please feel free to check me out on all social media platforms and rate subscribe and like, and give me comments and feedback as I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, happy practicing.